Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Data Analytics Check, where we discuss the latest trends and challenges faced in the data science and AI world. Uh, today, we've got an interesting topic uh, as we have a look at, into data strategy and humans, which obviously humans interesting uh, area. Uh, everyone is different in their own rights, which is obviously great. But yeah, it's going to be an interesting conversation, this. Today, I'm delighted to welcome special guest Tian Kai Feng, who is the uh, data strategy and data governance lead at Portworks, a technology global consultancy. So, welcome, Tian Kai. Do you want to briefly introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Very excited to be here. Yeah, I'm, uh, as you mentioned, the data strategy and governance lead at ThoughtWorks. That's my professional side. I've also just written a book and released a book about humanizing data strategy, which is um, something we will talk about today. I'm very eager to discuss that. And in my free time, I'm also uh, enjoying to make some music and some jokes and, and entertaining content about data with the hope that data can be more approachable and more of a, a basically topic that more people can understand and can engage with in the future as well. Yeah. yeah. So I Obviously, like I said before, I think everyone in, in the data, the data, I think everyone's in a data journey, aren't they? I think everyone's, you need to constantly learn. So, I mean, what was your motivations to obviously uh, release a book? Yeah. First of all, I think the, my answer to this is that I didn't plan on writing a book initially myself. <laughs> so, um, what, what, hap what happened basically was that last year I helped translate a book, um, which was Disrupting Data Governance by Laura Madsen from English to German for the German speaking data governance community. And um, that went really well, that, that whole project. And uh, the same publisher, Technics Publications, they um, asked me if I wanted to write my own book end of last year as well. And it was only in that yeah. moment that I was thinking about, okay, this is now an opportunity that I shouldn't really skip, but what would mm -hmm. I write about? And um, I realized that all my talks and keynotes in the past, as well as what I'm passionate about at work, all relate to the human aspect of data, but also at the same time realizing that in all of the books about data, that the human side is often described as important, but then without a lot of details. It's just saying, yes, mm. people is important. Okay, move on. Or change management is important, move on. Communication is important, and then move on. So I wanted to fill the gap a little bit to say, okay, we all agree that it's important, but how can you actually do it? So basically, the book came from exactly that motivation to say, if we want to really take people seriously in our data strategies, how can we actually do it with practical examples? And this is how the book basically came up. Yeah. Yeah. I think obviously it's really critical for businesses, isn't it? The human aspect, because mm -hmm. you know how difficult it is to change things Absolutely. in a business. Everyone's different in their own right, isn't it? You've got people that fear. You've got risk takers that can just go and do it. You've got all sorts of different people. And then obviously, it's, I guess every business knows where they're going, don't they? They know where they want to get to, but it's that squiggly line to get there, isn't it? It's like, how do, how do we get there? It's not a straight road. Not can't just get in a car and get there. It's, yeah, there's a, yeah, a massive journey there, isn't there? Because you've got all the resilience and a lot. And, and also, technological uh, changes. You've got everything. I think from doing this podcast, you just hear everyone's on their own journey. And that's why I like doing it because everyone's sharing like stories and you can take a snippet from that. Oh, actually, I could apply that into my my business, my game. So, yeah, I think it's definitely an interesting field. And I think a lot more needs to be worked on, doesn't it? Absolutely. I do also think that there's one reason why it's hard for many people to get into it more, it's because trying to be more people-centric means you need to appeal to your empathy, right? And use your empathy mm. to actually understand other people. But data as a field has been described as very fact-based and analytical and objective. So mm. it's really awkward for people to actually use the empathy again to yeah. understand each other and the behavior and mindset around it. So it's definitely something new, I would say, for a lot of people and applying that in a certain way it's just uh, a new way of doing things if working in data. And this is what I'm trying to give some yeah. advice on. Well, it's like, yeah. so you get a lot of tech leaders, but it's to go into that mix, obviously, it's always 
thing in the tech, isn't there? There's a lack of good managers about. But that's because you've got to raise your game to that next like emotional intelligence, haven't you? Because exactly. what you say to people is so critical. Like Absolutely. It's important because one, you could interpret something. You can say something how you think it is, but someone could interpret something differently. So you have that challenge is there. That's, and then that's the big challenges for a lot of, I'll say a lot of business and individuals as well. Because it's, I'll say every techie or data expert, they're, um, you're amazing in what you do. Like, right. you're, you're a specialist, say, even data governors, data engineering, data science. But then obviously when you add the soft skill, that is completely different ballpark, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, cool. So I look forward to this one. So let's dive straight into the first question, which is, so can you provide me an overview of how human factors influence the implementation and, and success of data strategies? Yes, absolutely. So I, I would say I start with what defining a little bit for myself what actually data strategy is, because it feels like there's no consensus about what it actually is. But uh, for me, it does actually mean to have a long-term direction about how people, process, and tools pay into driving value for an organization. And my aspect of the human side means to actually zoom in on the people aspect of the three. And in my book, I basically describe it as a framework of five C's, which are the main aspects of it, which are mm -hmm. competence, collaboration, communication, creativity, and conscience. And basically by addressing it from different ways and by zooming in on those five C's, there should be identifications of what can be improved and how to actually make people join the journey more intrinsically motivated to actually drive change with data instead of forcing them to do it and them becoming basically advocates and instead of just passive resistors to the same to a data. Cool. So what, so what is the big factors that influence this? Like, cause obviously some people will just, yeah, change. They'll be happy to change others a bit more re resistant. Yes. I think uh, all human beings are normally uh, animals of habits, right? I don't think anyone yeah. really particularly uh, likes change that is forced on them. But if people see the benefit of changing, like um, even in personal lives, changing a career or moving to a different place, then they're willing to drive it on their own. And what I'm yeah. trying to say is with a data strategy, you have um, usually it attached to business objectives. And that makes sense rationally that this is... Uh, a change needed to drive business uh, metrics or KPIs to success, right? But it doesn't emotionally resonate with people necessarily, right? So one of the things in the communication aspect or from the five Cs, I talk about how you have to frame the value of data change um, through a personal lens and not only the business lens, right? And for example, mm -hmm. if the business objective is profitability, right? And you need to reduce costs then maybe that means the immediate step is to increase productivity. So you don't spend that much time doing tedious things and you are more faster in it. Mm. But personally, in mind that a few people have to clean up data less, right? Maybe if the data actually is better managed from the beginning, downstream people don't have to clean up data five hours per week or something. Yeah, And that is actually what should be communicated to, right? That it's not only about higher profitability by how much percentage, but it's actually also about certain people we know about you having to spend all that time cleaning data. You will be relieved by that if we can actually do this data initiative in the right way. So framing it in different ways, addressing the personal needs and personal rewards mm -hmm. of uh, the change of data, I think is really key. Yeah, because I guess if you're looking from people's perspective, isn't it? Well, so you've got the business now is so multicultural. You've got people's different I guess what, what they've learned, what they've experienced, their ways of thinking is just going to be completely differ, isn't it, across. So I guess, obviously, like I said, if you, so I guess the communication aspect, you just got to make sure, obviously, that we're doing this because it's to benefit you, not to work against you, I guess would mm -hmm. be fair. Cool. Then with this, then, how critical is leadership in sort of driving and managing the like that strategy? Yeah, it's absolutely critical, right? I think but with leadership, I think you have to differentiate into different types of leadership. I think we're all used to people leadership and project leadership, right? So you hierarchically are managing people, so you are their leader, right? 
And you sometimes are a product manager or a product leader, and you need to just make sure that product actually is driving through success. But I feel like uh, what is a little bit less addressed is change leadership and thought leadership, which I think are beyond those other two, right? And with change leadership, I mean that really the leadership is also there to make sure that the change is embedded in the right way and that it's seen as a journey, that you make sure that we are not changing too quickly, but that we are changing one individual at a time to make them advocates one at a time and mm -hmm. really address their personal fears or personal resistance reasons to then um, basically turn them and convert them into believers, so to say, one after another. And with thought leadership, that's the missing piece to it too, right? Where if you can basically use also your expertise and your uh, public speaking skills as a leader, for example, to actually inspire people to see beyond what they're seeing in the day, to look at the bigger picture or to look at what others in the industry are doing or look at market trends, for example, then maybe more and more information can actually lead to people uh, seeing the bigger piece, piece of the puzzle and uh, seeing the bigger picture as well on their own, driving them again to become more advocates. So in mm -hmm. a way, I feel like it, it's more about differentiating and redefining what leadership actually means and that it's more than just a hierarchical and the project success tactical leadership that we all know about. It's more than that. And it's also more about convincing and influencing and empathizing with people. Yeah, so because you're getting that engagement across the whole team because you want, if everyone's on board, you're going to make changes, aren't you? Like, exactly. If they've got one, like, or you've got, say, 60 40, it's mm -hmm. going to be a bit of a headache, isn't it, for the leadership, uh, for probably a lot more meetings. Exactly. Uh, that's sort of big. Um, yeah. So, why do you think then businesses just, when they change this, they do too much at once? That's the, where the most lot of hesitancy comes from. Or do you think it's just, obviously it depends on the project. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say probably too much at once. It's more about acknowledging that it takes time to change. I think at least from what I learned about change management is that like next to the old world, let's say, and the new world, in between you have a long period called the neutral zone, right? Where actually mm -hmm. the old hasn't finished yet and the new hasn't completely started yet, but all of it is a little bit in transition. And I feel like a lot of people and leaders, they underestimate that transition phase because that takes time because of the people aspect. Shutting down a system and uh, migrating it all to the new one and then starting that new one, that's great. That's technical and uh, you can mm -hmm. set up dates. But everything in between, for people to actually adjust to the new system, to be able to directly use it, for example, that takes time. Yeah, You need to train them. You need to convince them that it's the new system is better. You need to show them the new things that they can do with the new system, et cetera, just for example. And all that takes time until you can actually confidently say, we're going to shut down the old one and only use the new one from now on. So all of that now on bigger scale means there's even more work to do to actually make people yeah. be part of the change journey. So I don't think... It's too much at once often because often you cannot, you don't have a choice to make it less. You have to just do it in one go, but you need to just do it slower and give yourself the freedom and the flexibility to do it in a speed that allows the organization to adjust to it. Yeah. No, interesting. Cool, cool. And then, so how can organizations get buy-in from all employees to support like new data strategies? Yes. So basically, I, I already mentioned the all framing into personal reward and business value. But mm -hmm. I feel like there's a lot also in regarding the general way of how we storytell the value of data strategies. And I basically, in my book, I describe a very simple structure, but that is having implications for everything we talk about, which is that you should always start with the why, then with the what, and then with the how. And the mm -hmm. why should always be an undeniable reason why this is something we need to do. And again, that is framed on business level and on personal level. The what is basically addressing what actions and decisions need to be taken to get there, right? That means, for example, uh, that we need to change the data model. It might mean that we need to open up a new revenue stream, whatever, like what is the actual things that need to be done? 
And then the last one is the how, and that means resources, that means planning, that means OKRs and shared objectives, et cetera, et cetera. All of the nitty gritty that needs to be figured out to actually do it then. But as data professionals and especially many data leaders too, I myself catch myself often doing that too. We are very passionate about how we do things. And we often start with the how, right? We talk about, look at all the great algorithms I coded <laughs> or look at all the nice systems I'm working with. But that is very detailed and often you lose people with it, right? They have no idea why you're doing things say, like this. It's too nerdy maybe for them almost, right? And in many ways. So that's why I say always start with a why and then the what and the how. And if you're not sure what the why even is, then you might have a bigger problem and you should do your homework first on why you do things even in the first place to then go to yeah. the what and the how. Okay. Yeah, no, I think, yeah, that's, that's a good way to put it because I think it's... Like any, that comes down to communication. I've discussed this so many podcasts now. Communication yes. is key across everything, isn't it? It's that educational piece, isn't it? Like, why are we doing this? Because if someone's, like I said, you're going to get different people. Like, they fear this change is going to impact their job or their level of responsibilities. That needs to be like that needs to be that hurdle needs to be overcome because that's going to cause resistance, and then that's. Like I said, you're not going to get that change quick enough, are you, for Absolutely. which you anticipated. And then that's just one person. And if it comes to a lot of different people, or you might have people even like wanting to leave the business because of it. Or, and then you've got to obviously go and rehire again. And obviously that delays things. And that all adds to the, it's just adds, builds upon the situation, right. doesn't it? So, yeah. What would you say then have been some of the common resistance to change for data initiatives? Yes. I think there's, I would say there's actually a bottom-up reasons and there are top-down reasons. I would say the bottom-up ones are usually that there's this missing clarity on why another change is needed. Again, going mm -hmm. back to people being animals of habit, right? They, if they got used to certain things working, they don't see and they don't necessarily understand the reason why they now need to adjust to a new way of doing things again if the previous way was working. So that clarity to tell them why exactly a change is needed, why the old way is not working, or why a new way is the better way of working, that has to be just really thorough and really tr trickling down to all of the operational people as well. Mm -hmm. And top-down is the more difficult and critical one, I would say, even, because that comes from C-level people or, or other top leaders in the organization visibly uh, not believing in data and not at all right like let's say for example there you're showing them a report and they say no i don't i disagree with the numbers we're going to make our own decisions not based on these numbers after all and if that is being made aware of with everyone then there's no motivation at all anymore um, to do anything with data right it's like, mm. okay if our leaders don't even believe in what we're doing then what's the point of doing all of this and that can be really That's another head, tricky mate. exactly <laughs> Again, that, that goes back to the point that you need to create that buy-in and that and advocacy and collaboration with the right stakeholders in the first place. It, the key should be to not to prevent these situations to happen in the first place and to have made them aware and make them being on board as early as possible so you don't get these kind of bad surprises. And as long as you keep basically the operational people, the technical people, and the um, strategic people all aligned with what you're doing, then you can maybe, basically, you can definitely reduce the resistance and you can just keep going. But staying on top of resistors and seeing how and why they are behaving that way and dealing with it in a timely manner is really key. Yeah. I think also you've got to look at like external factors. If you look at the pandemic, like, Work from home was obviously some companies did it. But that's just completely changed the, the situation now, hasn't it? Like now it's obviously the hybrid approach seems to be the most popular one. And even obviously data, previously people were hesitant on the project, weren't they? I guess you've had the LLM boom and then that's just completely shifted mindset, hasn't it? Them sort of factors do impact, don't they? The people's perspectives on things. Yeah, I think obviously you've got to bear in mind that as well, haven't we? Absolutely. 
And then, so for them to be like effectively managed, is it just more, how do you say it's the best ways to carry it out? Is it more like group, group or group sessions, one-on-ones? How's best to sort of accommodate this? I think with a very active resistance, you need to actually address it one-on-one because uh, mm-hmm. even the group dynamic itself would create uh, a weird a way where people need to be more stubborn than they need to be even uh, on their opinions because they have a face to lose, right? If they agree that they were wrong about something in a group. Mm. So I would definitely recommend to do it one-on-one. But I I think even beyond that, I'm also recommending an approach to what I call assigning personas to stakeholders, right? And I know usually when you do stakeholder management, you have, you cluster them into decision makers, non-decision makers, and into advocates and resistors, right? And that's usually what to do it. But my idea is to assign even more personas to them to actually uh, differentiate a little bit on how to uh, engage with them. For example, per there's the persona type of being skeptics versus believers, right? So there are always people that are always believing in the next bad thing. They are like, oh, great, yeah. uh, let's do it. And the skeptics always need more time to actually get convinced. And they first mm-hmm. question everything about the new thing that's happening. And then you have also doers for the thinkers, for example, right? So those that actually think a lot and have a lot of ideas and conceptual uh, new things in their head, mm-hmm. but don't actually think about the feasibility in the end. So they're not able to do anything of that. But you also have people that are doing um, as quickly as possible without thinking too much about it and then realize that they should have thought about it a bit more before I just get to do things and a lot of people in between. And so um, thinking about all of those stakeholders being on those ranges and where they are can give you a more differentiated view on how to actually talk to them, right? What is the thing that they need to hear? And in what way can you empathize with them to then address what they want to do, but give them the right nudge to actually think in the direction you want them to think about? Yeah, it's really just a more differentiated approach with more dedication to identify personas within your stakeholders and address them is really key. Yeah, cool. No, that's good. That's it. Communication. Exactly. <laughs> that's key. And obviously, you just moved on to how important is communication and transparency in the process? And then, to, I guess, to look at best practices to recommend as well. Like how, how important is it? Because obviously, you're going to get John wants one way, Sally wants another way. So obviously, how are you going to get them to meet in the middle because yes absolutely. But you like you said again you get people that are stubborn who need to be informed just be good to get your thoughts yes best practice is a good thing i think there's definitely not a one-size-fits-all approach to this but the one thing yeah. i learned is that data people rarely over communicate it's very rare that data people ever over communicate they usually are very self-conscious and that's why they under communicate and I think that is just a general problem. It's not seen as the most important thing usually in, in data efforts, right? And when mm-hmm. it's then being communicated, it's being kept very short and there's not much, a lot of, uh, there's not a lot of, let's say, framing or phrasing that is put into it to make it sound impactful to people. So what I'm actually suggesting is to have more of a communication toolbox, right? And that mm-hmm. means, for example, to think more structurally about the communication and not just do it when you think about it all of a sudden, right? And that means that ideally you have a plan where you can say, I want to talk to specific audiences on specific channels, for example, like a Teams message or rather an email or rather a meeting mm-hmm. in certain frequencies about certain topics with certain tonalities through certain people in my team. And the more you then actually plan ahead and you can mix and match these different aspects of it into communication paths, then you can actually make it much more intentional and then address people in the right way doing what needs to be done. So I I think the best practice that I'm trying to say is it's more about being intentional and structured in your approach of communication Mm -hmm. and not to just leave it be like an ad hoc or improvised thing. Just give it a bit more attention. And I think that automatically can make you better um, in what you're trying to achieve. Yeah. So you just... Yeah, I agree. And then, obviously, with one socket that's agreed, you've got the change. Yeah. Then how, 
Pat, what role does like training and skill development play in this, like the success or adoption of the new like data strategy? I think, uh, the, of course, there's a topic of data literacy, which over the last years mm -hmm. has been really mentioned and discussed a lot. And I do agree that this is an important effort to make that you bring the whole level of confidence, but also knowledge about how to work with data on an organization level to the next level. So at least there's some foundational knowledge there to deal with it. But I believe also that having only pushed for data literacy has been a little bit one-sided over the last years, because that meant that we didn't talk enough about uh, data people having to learn about the business expertise too, right? So mm -hmm. I would rather say that the key is to not only do business uh, data literacy, but also drive business acumen with the data teams. So there's actually from both sides taking a step towards each other, right? Business people understanding more about data and data people understanding more about business. This is how you come together and speak the same language finally. And so it's basically how can we not only make efforts in spending effort on data courses, but how can we actually bring business experts in the organization and maybe outside outsourced help to then actually increase that business acumen to then go onto one level. Mm. And I think the next step is also that I feel like all of that learning and upskilling is good, but it's for nothing if you don't let people apply them in their day-to-day, -day, right? If it's only a course that they're taking and then they never have the chance to actually apply it, they're going to forget about it, right? It's, it's a simple thing of learning something theoretically and not uh, practicing it means you're going to lose it. So uh, that needs a cultural change and a little bit of a change of failure, right? So letting people be able to experiment and try out things that they learned in their day-to-day -day and allowing them to fail and to learn from it to then apply it in different and better ways again afterwards. So I think the other important point here is to just create that culture of being able to experiment and try new things to then really embed what they learned into practice and then remember it for the future as well. Yeah. No, I think I completely agree. I think obviously with the learning aspects, I think you need, I suppose companies, they just, just do constant learning because so you, if you kind of cook for a week, yeah. two weeks later, you forget it. If you, like I said, if you're not applying it, you just, it's human nature, isn't it? So you need Absolutely. to keep that constant learning thing. Like even myself now, I'm learning uh, Spanish. Like nice. you need to keep, you need to keep constant repetition because even I guess like yourself, like playing piano, you, you need to keep doing it, don't you? You need to, that constant learning, absolutely, uh, constant repetition. It's repetition, isn't it? Because you're going to forget until it's ingrained in you. Like you're doing it daily, or you just know it inside out. That's when you become an expert, or that's when you can fight the knowledge. And then you can coach others, can't you? You can mentor others. And then that's that constant learning circle. Absolutely. Yes. Cool. And then I guess, obviously, when designing data strategies, how can you, how can it be designed to consider human element? Ensuring that they're like user friendly and meet the needs of employees. Yeah. That's actually, I like the question a lot because it already implies that people consider the needs of the employees in their strategy, which in reality probably is not that often the case, to be very honest. And <laughs> so I think the first step is to even just consider it. That's a very good point, right? For your data strategy to be more humanized and people-centric, you need to intentionally want it to be intentional and more human-centric. Reminding yourself of how to actually have the people element embedded in your data strategy is a really mm -hmm. important one. I think in many data strategies, usually there is the pillar of people and organization, but that usually is crystallized in upskilling um, efforts and saying that they all should get upskilled or certified or something. And it's usually something related to like a fluctuation metric, right? Like just a satisfaction related or um, let's say um, attrition related or loyalty related to stay with the employer. But all of that are more on the surface. I think what needs to be more done is to address the whole thing of how people are an enabler of a data strategy and not just that your team is a happy team and that no one is leaving the company within a certain time period. And so yeah. it's really when you decide on the main directions of your data strategy, 
imagine what the participation contribution of people are. Does it need to be how much is from the data teams and data professionals? How much is from the senior leaders? How much is needed from uh, the business stakeholders? What is missing for them to be the enablers for all of that? And then define priorities based on what you think is missing to actually do it. In my book, I actually do have a kind of a second to last chapter is about a gap analysis. So you can actually use the five C's to go through a series of questions and see mm -hmm. which of the questions you can answer with yes and which ones with no, which could give you an indicator what you're missing, right? All of the questions that you answer with no are optimization potentials. So you could actually start with those. And then it's basically trying to, yeah, ensure that you're people-centric in that way. And whenever you identify there might be a people problem to address it with dedication and with priority. Nah, interesting. And then I guess, obviously, when you're driving change, it's just, you want results, don't you? And it's just part and parcel. What, what metrics could you use to measure the effectiveness of like change efforts within the like, data strategy initiatives? Yes, I think with data strategy overall, I'm strongly a believer that it should be tied directly to business objectives anyway, right? Because if a data strategy is successful, then data is fully enabling and empowering all of the business objectives to be met, which means that the overarching business KPIs all should be uplifting and performing better because of data efforts. And then it's more of a contribution that data has to it. But that doesn't mean that you still don't need more operational metrics to actually steer your operations within data, right? And change management is one of those, right? For example, in itself, you could argue and see how many people you communicated to and how many of those have actually now adopted a new way of working, right? That could be done with a survey or it could be done with some uh, team meetings and seeing who has the worries about it. It could also be done uh, from a people point of view that you talk about how much time is spent actually in collaboration and how good the collaboration is going from a stakeholder feedback point of view, as well as from a, a data team point of view, and that overall the collaboration is now being better done and it's more technology enabled and it's faster to achieve certain tasks. So it's up to you really to define what operationally makes more sense for you to steer mm -hmm. and where you want it to see an uplift as well. But I would differentiate it just between the business-oriented ones, which should be tied to the business objectives, and the more operational ones of running data efforts and data projects. Yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. I think obviously it would depend on like, what your, your initiative is, isn't it, really? Exactly. exactly. Yeah. So, okay, brilliant. Yeah. It's been amazing having you on. So, I'm, it's been a great discussion. Yeah, anything else you'd like to add? Just was he buy your book? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, besides, of course, I would be very happy if people buy my book. Other than that, I'm happy to discuss with people what their thoughts are about the human side of data, what learnings they had, and mm -hmm. maybe if they were readers of my book, what maybe it caused different thoughts and additional thoughts on. I'm very happy to discuss more of that and also learn more about that. So yeah, feel free to reach out on me or via LinkedIn, and I'm happy to talk with more people. It's been a pleasure having you. Thank you. Thank you.